Well, greetings, everyone. I'm excited that you're interested in learning about some herb gardening here in our desert environment. I grew up in Michigan in the Midwest, where we grew all kinds of vegetables and herbs. When I moved to the valley, I found out that things were very, very different. When we're talking about our herb gardening, we definitely need to become familiar with the soil that we're working with in our yards. Moving here from the Midwest, when people talked about soil, I just kind of in my mind kept thinking, what soil? <laughs> this pale tan stuff, that's not soil. Well, this is our desert soil. It is very, very low in organic matter. That is why it is such a pale color compared to other areas, um, higher elevation or more northern um, you know, temperate zones where the soil is very, very dark and, and rich with organic material. It's very important that you decide what types of herbs you're going to grow. I'm going to, towards the second portion of this evening, I'm going to share some examples of both native and or desert adapted herbal plants, as well as some of the more traditional herbal plants. When you're going to work with some of the more traditional herbs, this would be the things like basil and mint and um, lemon balm and catnip. You need to really work on enriching the soil. Load it up with compost, mix that in really well. No matter what type of soil you have here in the valley, a lot of us have in areas of the valley, very clay soil, it's comprised of primarily minuscule particles. That means it gets compacted very, very easily. There are some areas, especially you know, in Scottsdale, you might be in an area where you have a more rocky or sandy soil. This is comprised primarily of larger um, particles and even you know, rocks in some area. Middle of the road would be what we would call a loam. That's a blend of very fine to large particles that accommodates a wider range of plants. No matter what you're starting with as your desert soil in your yard, for these traditional herbs, you're going to need to really add in a good amount of compost, this organic matter. It would be similar or the same as preparing soil for a traditional vegetable garden. So really focus on that organic matter. If hey, you're Kirsi, I, yes. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. There was some questions um, that they can't see you that your video's not on. And I don't know if you did that on purpose or if you wanted no. your- I'm, I'm not able, I'm not okay. able to turn my video on. I'm That's sorry. okay. <laughs> when I try it, it gives me, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, okay. Let me um, do some <laughs> investigating and I'll try to do that and get that turned on for you while you continue to talk. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the soil, when we're working with our native desert herbs, or those from other arid regions. We have a lot of herbs that originate in the Mediterranean. They are developing in conditions very similar to what we have here. A lot of them are, are growing in very mineral soil with low, low organic matter, um, intense heat, intense sun. They just perform so well here. So, I forgot to define what is an herb. Well, a lot of people think of culinary herbs or maybe medicinal herbs, but I'm a member of the Arizona Herb Association and the Herb Society of America. Our working definition of an herb is a plant that has current or historic uses. So it could be for aromatherapy, it could be used for dyes, it could be used for glue, for um, construction, just about anything, if it's useful, we consider it an herbal plant. 
So that, you know, opens up a real wide range of plant materials that we can work with. Okay, so consider what type of- Sorry, Kirti, <laughs> I'll interrupt you again. That's super fascinating, by the way, and I didn't know you had those titles. Um, but uh, I believe you should be able to turn on your video now. Did there we go, yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. The, the types of herbs you're interested in, you need to figure out whether they are more traditional in need of that organic matter or the very, very easy going desert adapted plants or natives. Water is critical. It is going to be, a, the way water will infiltrate or percolate into the soil will be affected by your soil type. So no matter what, you should be familiar with the soil in your yard for so many different reasons. Definitely for applying water properly. Now, if you have, if you're growing the traditional herbs and you've really loaded up that soil, whatever you're working with, with a lot of compost, a lot of organic matter, that will essentially make it similar to a loam as far as the water will percolate about as deep as it does wide. For those of us who have a heavy clayey soil with those fine particles, water, say for instance, we have a drip irrigation system and we're going to apply one gallon of water. Well, that one gallon in a clay soil it's going to be so, so slow to percolate downward, it's going to spread wider. Okay, so that's its wetting pattern. For those who have a very porous soil, whether it's sandy or gravelly or rocky, that water will shoot straight down and not spread very wide at all. So at least for me, I'm a visual person. This kind of helps me think about when I'm applying water, what's, where's it going? How's it spreading? And so forth. And this will, I think, truly help you in figuring out how to water your plants best. Another aspect of watering is we always want to water deep enough for a full development of the root system of the type of plant we're growing. For some of the traditional herbs, some of which are what we would consider annuals. They grow and complete their life cycle in one season or one year. Most often they have a short root system, not more than maybe eight, 10, probably at most a foot, eight or 10 inches or a foot deep. So to accommodate full root development, we're going to be applying, once it really gets growing, water to about a foot deep. If we're growing some of our native herbal shrubs, which you'll see some great examples of, their root systems very often develop even two feet down into the soil. We wanna make sure we apply enough water that will go two feet deep to encourage a full vigorous root development. If you don't have a good root system here, particularly during the summer, you're not gonna make it. So you need to, to encourage that full root development. If we're watering too shallowly, that will encourage more of the root development way up high in the soil profile. During the summer, where does the soil get the hottest? The top few inches. Where does it dry the fastest? The top few inches. So you'd be forcing the roots of your plant to exist in the harshest profile or section of the soil profile. So we want them to, to grow nice and deep. There are herbal trees even. Um, desert willow, for example. Most of our desert trees, including the desert herbal trees, will develop the bulk of their root system within the top two to three feet of the soil. Now, the tree's root system will spread super wide um, very often much wider than what we would consider the, the canopy of the tree um, exceeding the drip line. Some of our larger herbal shrubs definitely will develop these larger root systems that extend past 
the form that we see above ground. So we want to make sure we're watering deep enough, no matter what we're growing, whether it has a very shallow root or one that grows deeper. How do we know if we're watering deep enough? I really recommend having a soil probe. What you're gonna do half an hour or so after you water, go out and start literally poking around. Pick a few spots and press this probe. Here I am pointing at it with my finger. Um, press this probe here down into the soil. These are usually made in a three foot length. This is a gardening friend and she painted each of the three feet a different color. So what, what you wanna do is push into the ground. It will move easily through moist soil and basically just stop when it hits dry soil. So you're gonna eyeball where it stopped, pull that back out of the soil and you'll be able then to measure how deep the moisture went. Do that in a few areas of your, um, the perimeter or the moistened area, perimeter of your plant, in case you get fooled by a rock in one spot, you'll, you'll get a good idea. So this can help you um, decide, oh, you know, I need to water longer or whoa, <laughs> I don't need to be watering three feet deep for my little annual herb plant. That's a waste of water, really, um, a gross, overuse or over application. There are so many different ways to apply water. Overall, I recommend applying it at ground level for a few different reasons, but I think in spite of me um, having friends or seeing gardens that they consistently use sprinklers, um, I think that can set you up for some potential problems if you're using sprinklers all the time. Not saying don't get the foliage wet, but usually an application at ground level or lower, um, low towards the ground, will reduce the amount of evaporation, definitely, um, as the water's being applied. And during the summer, we can have accumulation of salts on leaf tissue if we're using sprinklers every few days, which you might be doing for things like basil. So um, they're just different systems. I think it's really easy to use something that is um, hooked into an automated irrigation system. There are some great materials you can use. Um, I do recommend whatever you're using, make sure the emission device, the emitter is pressure compensating. That will ensure that from way at the start of the line to way at the end of the line, you will have consistent water delivery instead of a lot of water pressure and a lot more water applied here, way down at the end of the line, much less water, depending on how long that stretch is. When you're working with your system um, with drip irrigation, um, it's very simple to set in a system throughout a yard that could be utilized for a lot of the desert herbal plants. If you're working with more traditional herbs, make sure you have a valve designated for their water needs. I think everybody with a, a native, or I mean, sorry, a desert herb landscape, I've, a desert plant landscape should have at least three valves to accommodate different watering schedules of your trees, your desert shrubs, um, your desert perennials or ground covers. Make sure you add one more in for those traditional herbs or your vegetable garden. You might be able to use the same valve for, for both situations since most likely they're both going to be need, needing much more frequent water and perhaps much more shallow application. Hey, Kirti, we have our first question. Question yes. and it is, yes. is it better to plant herbs in pots or full gardens? Well, that's a good question. I would recommend if you have um, some major challenge or not so major, um, if your soil is just so horrible that it's a battle to work with it, you could go with big containers or raised planters. Also, big containers 
uh, or raised planters are great for a lot of us as we're aging and we can't bend over so much and so forth. So if you're going to use containers, make sure that you use a good quality, well-draining potting soil. Okay, don't dig up the soil from your yard and put it into that container. That can cause problems um, sometimes with diseases, but certainly it can be a challenge for water percolation through that soil. So a good potting soil, make sure the container is big. If you want something to grow through the summer, I recommend at least a two foot diameter container. And that should be um, you know, good for growing perhaps even a few different herbs or something, a, a larger type of an herbal plant also. And you can just go big, big, big if you like. Um, so, you know, there, there are definitely reasons that it could be easier to grow things in containers, but make sure you've got a well-draining potting soil in that container. So as with our landscape, we want to adjust the schedule for our irrigation system or whatever method of water application. Adjust your schedule throughout the different seasons of the year. We're going to be needing much less water applied during the colder winter months than those hottest summer months. And if you're lucky enough to get a really good rain and you don't have a system that will you know, one of the fancier systems that will um, turn off for a period. When you get a good rain, go out to your system and turn that off for, a, you know, maybe a, even a cycle or so uh, to take advantage of that good rain. Now, it's a great thing during the summer months to mulch around those more traditional herbal plants to make a buffer. This helps hold moisture in the soil longer slows evaporation. It also helps keep the soil a little more cool around the root systems of these plants. Yeah, when it's 115 degrees, it's um, not gonna help a huge amount, but it helps a little bit. Now think in terms of light, the exposure that the plants will be receiving. Some of our traditional herbs will not tolerate direct sun all day during the summer months. If that's the case, you might be able to strategically place them in a garden setting where in the afternoon, they would have some shade cast upon them by perhaps a tree or a wall or some other building. And that should help them get through those hottest periods of the year. You might look for some vines that could offer um, some midday or afternoon shade during the summer months for those plants as well to give them a little protection. If that's not possible, you might want to use some of that, what we call shade cloth, this artificial material that will ask, act as kind of a, a sunscreen to lower the amount and intensity of the sunlight hitting your plants. Now, you don't want to overdo it. So many of the products that we find in especially the big box stores, those shade cloths are designed more for people and pets, our comfort, but it's going way too far from too much sun exposure to not enough for your plants. Make sure whatever you're using is rated at 30 to 50 or even 60% reduction in the sun penetrating through it. This is a very light, I think this is a 30%. And if you look here, you just barely see um, the patterning of that shade, but it really helps these plants at the hottest time of the day, the hottest part of the year. So focus, um, when you are using shade cloth, focus to be providing that protection overhead and on the west facing side of your plants. Anything would be appreciative of early morning sun when it's not so intense and the temperature is still lower. Another thing we need to think hey, about. Hey, Kirithi. Yes. We've got another question. What kind of mulch do you recommend? There are different things you could utilize. 
The examples I showed were of straw. That's one thing you could use. You could use compost. You could use um, mulch, mulch material. So basically the difference between mulch and compost, um, if we're thinking of that organic matter, um, mulch is organic, but it's not decomposed to the extent that compost is, that we would work into the soil. So you might even want to use um, fresh wood chips. Maybe you know an arborist that could, you know, um, give you a bucket or um, load of, of chips. That could be used also. Whatever you're using, you might even consider mixing it into the soil at the end of that growing season and letting it become part of that organic matter in the soil, depending on what it is and how it has started to decompose over the season. So wide range of things. Um, some people even shred up newspapers and scatter that around to help. Just, you just wanna have that buffer between the sun and the soil. This is an example of some freeze damage. Nasturtiums are very frost tender. Generally plants, earlier in the season, if we have an early frost, plants can be more easily damaged. Something like the nasturtium, younger plants will be much more harshly affected than um, larger, more mature plants. You might totally lose something that's very young with a freeze, whereas a plant that's larger might have just some um, minor damage, but the growth tip is still unaffected. That plant can continue to grow through the season. If you are needing to protect some plants from a, a hard frost or freeze, you could use old sheets and things, but I'm a lazy gardener, so I prefer to use, and you wanna totally cover your plants that would be susceptible to damage. I prefer to use what we call frost cloth. The idea is totally cover your plants. If you can get out mid or late afternoon, it's great because you'll trap the warmest air of the day around the plants. Also, any heat that will radiate from the ground up overnight will be trapped there. So that's your maximum benefit to keep that plant a few, at least a few degrees more comfortable. This is a product that's ready, readily available from a lot of the garden centers in our area. It's a, a, just a thin cloth. It lets about 70% of the sunlight through, very lightweight. So you could cover your plants and leave them covered for a few days or even a week if you have several nights of cold predicted. The material, it's so lightweight, you can just drape it over the plants and it won't crush them. Or you could have some sort of a frame or support that it would um, be you know, draped over such as um, this really nice um, garden is a raised planter bed and they devise a structure. It's just like pulling a curtain, you know, two people, one on each side, they just pull that, um, keep it secure with some, some rocks and those plants stay nice and warm overnight. So just, we, we have to um, learn enough about our plants to know what type of sun, well, what type of, type of soil they need, what type of sun or shade they need, and also, what are their susceptibilities to cold during the winter months? Fertilizer. If you're working with these great desert herbal plants or things from the Mediterranean or another arid region around the world, those plants have evolved with very low amounts of nutrients need compared to something like a more traditional herb, your basil your catnip, your lemon balm, they need especially more nitrogen. For most of our native herbs, I'd say pff, you don't even need to fertilize them. But for the more traditional, I would really recommend for a variety of reasons that you use an organic fertilizer. The composition of your fertilizer when it's organic 
you see the lower numbers compared to a synthetically produced type of fertilizer material. But the thing is, especially with the first number indicating the nitrogen, the formulation of the nitrogen in our organic products is such that it's almost like a slow release fertilizer. Um, little microorganisms need to break that down a little bit so that it can be utilized by our plants. With the synthetic nitrogen sources, it's very water soluble. If we're growing mint and you have to water it every two or three days in the summer, you apply your synthetic nitrogen source and within a few waterings, it's washed down below the root zone. So for that reason alone, I would recommend the use of the organics, but there are a lot of other reasons too. There are products that are liquid. You would follow directions. Usually they need to be diluted. If you're using a dry product, you'll follow the directions. Usually it will tell you how much to use per square footage. So either, you know, just find a preference and that will work. If it's working for you, it's gonna work for your plants. So most often for your traditional herbs, you'd be applying um, a light fertilizer maybe every few weeks during the growing season. And as I mentioned, for most of our native desert herbs or the Mediterranean herbs, you really don't need to apply fertilizer. Hey, Kirti, we yes. have another question. If someone yeah. is leaving um, over the summer, like June through August, what they sh what should they be doing to the raised bed gardens to maintain and protect the soil? I would say so. They're I'm I'm assuming that they mean they're going to have plants still growing through the summer. Um, you'd want to make sure that you have a nice mulch before you, you take off, um, mulch that the surface of the soil. And if it seems like it might be necessary, go ahead and put up some of that shade cloth if you need to. Make sure that your irrigation system is in top condition. If you don't have a system that you can check on remotely, um, so many things we can, you know, manipulate or control through our, our phones or a tablet these days. If that's not the case, I really recommend that you have a gardening buddy or neighbor who could just, you know, maybe once a week or every other week, at least, um, just check in to make sure things are getting watered um, properly. So pest control, some People, depending on where you're located, might have big pests with big ears and big hind legs. Yes, rabbits. If that's the case, usually a barrier is about the best means of protecting your plant. Just create some type of enclosure, whether it's around an individual plant or a garden area. Have an enclosure, um, a barrier so that that nasty little guy or girl can't just can't get to your plant to cause damage. Chicken wire is very effective. It's not very aesthetically pleasing, uh, but it, it is effective as a barrier for rabbits. If you have smaller pests, as in insects, I strongly recommend that you look to free help and you don't have to drive around looking for that free help. Free help will just arrive in your garden if you're not using um, a lot of chemicals. These helpers need to feel safe coming to your yard. So a lot of insects, which we would refer to as beneficial insects, help control bad insects in your garden. Lady beetles, definitely are very prominent in the world of beneficial insects and keeping the populations of bad insects in a tolerable uh, level. There are many different, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Hi, 
I'm so sorry. There are different types of lady beetles, not just the red ones with a few black spots on them. Even this is one of our natives. It's called an ashy gray. My favorite, just because of its name, is the twice stabbed lady, lady beetle. But it's important to, to know the insects you have in your garden, which are the good ones, which are ones that just might be a curiosity to observe, or which ones could be doing damage. No matter what, <clears throat> you also need to know their life cycles. This is sounding so overwhelming, but it's not. With our beneficial insects, something such as the lady beetle, it has a life cycle just like butterflies. So if we think back to, what was that? Elementary or you know, secondary school, we learned the life cycle of the, the butterfly. Well, lady beetles will lay eggs or ladybugs. They'll lay eggs, usually they're oval, orange in color, <clears throat> laid in a cluster. Eggs hatch and what we have are the larvae. They are voracious eaters of small bed insects. Things, especially winter going into the spring, we have a lot of those small soft bodied aphids that can suck and suck and suck the life out of your plants. They will each, one of these larvae will eat hundreds in a day to help keep that population in control. So they will eat and what we do, what we call molt, they'll shed their skin so they can get even bigger. They'll do that a few times and then they will pupate. And with some of our ladybugs, it's going to be this orangish or red color, just like the chrysalis of the, the butterfly. Once they emerge from that pupil case, these have already emerged, you have the next generation of adults and then they start that life cycle all over again. Don't look. <clears throat> some other great helpers. So the lady beetles, they're usually present during the cooler season when we start getting, you know, up into the 90s, they're smart, they go to higher elevation. Green lace wings, however, tend to be here and active almost year round. The adults are so lovely. Adult ladybugs will eat a lot of these bad insects as well as um, nectar. Adult lace wings only feed on nectar. Once they lay eggs, which are little cream color ovals suspended on almost like a silk or thread-like um, structure, once those eggs hatch, you have larvae that are a little bit similar looking to the, the ladybug larvae. They are voracious eaters of bad insects. So the adult needs nectar, but these larvae, they will just chew right through, mow right through, great quantities of bad insects. And finally, when they pupate, they have a little round spun case. From that, you'll get your next adult emerge. Crane mantids, we have a few different types here, native, as well as the more robust um, imported. They are great helpers. They don't discriminate. If they don't find enough bad insects or bad pests, they will start eating other beneficials. But overall, I'd say they are great to have in your garden. And they're active through a good portion of the year. Egg cases can vary depending on the species of the praying mantis. So both the adult and the young that are developing will eat bad insects. Interesting. Uh uh, Cure team, um, yes. someone is wondering if um, they've, they've lost uh, three plantings of basil due to pests last summer. Do quail eat herbs? Quail can be very, very destructive. They do have favorites, but they can definitely um, just rip and shred plants to bits, um, certainly. Yeah, so you'd want to make sure that they've got maybe through some of your desert native plants through most of the year, you'd wanna to try to make sure they have a good source of seed and um, some water also. And that might reduce them going after your things like your basil with that tender leaf. Yeah. So 
there is a tiny little parasitic wasp. Actually, there are different species, but um, these tiny wasps, a female will seek out an aphid, one of the bad bugs, lay an egg in it, that egg hatches, and the larvae feed on the innards of your aphid. So they're developing as that aphid's getting a little bit larger. And finally, initially they don't kill it, but finally when they're, they, they're pupating, they emit a chemical that makes the exoskeleton of the aphid, whether it's one of the black ones or green ones or red ones or whatever species or type of aphid or orange ones, what will happen is this chemical will make their exoskeleton kind of puff out and turn a, a, a kind of a tan color. Once that wasp emerges from its pupil stage, it will cut a round hole in that, well, it's actually the entomological term, aphid mummy. So they will cut that round hole and you have the next adults emerging to go take care of more bad insects in your garden. So some of these helpers, you really don't even notice them. They're so small. And here's an example. This is late spring when um, there's been a lot of aphid activity. We just see all these natural helpers. This is the larvae of a green lacewing. You can see pupil cases of ladybugs. So all of these helpers have come in. Oh, and here were some eggs from, from the green lacewings also. So if you slow down and look around, you'll see evidence of these helpers in your garden. A few more, uh, assassin bugs. They are, I am so sorry about my neighbors. I don't, I'm, I'm assuming you can hear that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the assassin bugs, they have a little structure like a stylet that they will pierce and suck the fluids out of their prey. They produce a group of eggs. From those hatch these little nymphs and eventually they will develop into these um, adult assassin bugs. So both the adults and the young will feed on bad insects. But if you notice here, that adult is taking um, a little sip of nectar. So basically no matter what type of beneficial insect it is, as well as a lot of our pollinators. You wanna have a lot of flowering plants in your garden to provide nectar and pollen also for the bees. I would caution the use of organic pesticides even. Um, sometimes we think they're totally safe to use. A lot of these organic pesticides can be just as harmful to our helpers as they are to our target bad insect pests in the garden. So even with, if it's organic, try to limit the use of that. And overall, you could be eliminating almost totally the use of any type of a chemical, a pesticide, if you really work to have a safe garden for a lot of these helpers. So not only the beneficial insects, but lizards that you invite into your garden will help with insect um, patrol. To <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me, toads at night geckos. Um, so a lot of helpers can be present when we allow for a good safe habitat to develop in our garden. Now there are some of these um, organics that we would classify as botanical pesticides. Um, most often these days we find pyrethrin and neem in products that are on the, the shelf. <clears throat> Overall, these botanicals, they become inert ingredient, ingredients more quickly in the environment. But as I say, um, pyrethrin, now that's different from pyrethrum, which is a, a synthetically, a synthetic reproduction of what we would find with this particular pyrethrum daisy, that persists in the environment for a very, very, very long time. But this botanical original version, it will break down quickly, but it can be very lethal to a range of beneficial insects and pollinators. So 
no matter what you're using, always read labels, be very cautious so that you're not um, killing off these helpers and um, organisms that are beneficial to your garden and our overall landscapes. So now let's get into the planting. You could plant some of these herbs from seed. The fun thing about that is you usually have a wider variety available through seed. If you're going to direct seed, you wanna make sure your soil's well prepared. There aren't any big chunks of um, you know, clods of soil or rocks in the soil. Just think of a little seed having an easy start in life. Most often when you're purchasing seeds, the packet or a catalog or their website will have information that tells you how deep to plant that seed, how far you need to space the seed apart, how long it will take it to germinate. That's a really good thing to know, you know, so that you're not freaking out after three days when something most likely won't germinate for perhaps even up to 21 days um, can really help, you know, put your, your mind at ease. Overall, you have usually a lot of great information available from these seed companies. If you're getting seed from a friend and they just give you an envelope, it doesn't even have what the plant is, <laughs> but you're, you know, you'll remember somehow, then overall, think about the size of the seed. If it's very small, you plant it just very shallowly, uh, maybe a, a 16th or, or an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch. For larger seed, you plant that a little more deep into the soil. <clears throat> Very often, especially if we're working with tiny seed, we'll have to thin our plants to make sure they have enough space to grow and flourish to maturity. If we are getting young plants, um, starts or transplants, um, whatever you'd like to refer to them, as if you're getting, is working with those, you wanna make sure that the root system is in good shape. If there is any indication of the root starting to um, wind and form to the pot, you wanna loosen or fluff that root ball gently so that the roots will then grow out into the new soil space that it has available. <clears throat> the, range of herbs, as I mentioned, that we could grow around here is actually so tremendous. It's mind boggling. I'm going to share with you um, just a few, since we don't have so much time together uh, today, lavenders. These are of Mediterranean origin. They absolutely must have a super well-draining soil and a lot of sun. If you've got those two conditions, you can grow a wide range of lavenders. There are so many different species and cultivars, cultivated varieties available that it can be so, so fun having a, a, a lavender garden even. They do have slightly different bloom um, seasons and um, the bloom structure that cluster itself might be a little varied from type to type of lavender. They will range in size. Some will only get about a foot in height. Others will grow three to four foot tall and wide. So again, do your homework. Uh, this is one of the easiest to grow around here, the sweet lavender, um, Lavendula heterophylla, as are the French lavenders. They are just really tough. You do not need to worry about cold temperatures freezes with the majority of the lavenders. They can take pretty much everything we throw at them, but they have to have that really well-draining soil. The only one that you have to think about or worry about when we are getting down into the 20s, when we get below freezing, the fern leaf lavender can be um, really fragile or, or susceptible to freeze damage. If we get down to low 20s, it, a plant might even die. So this is the only one of all the lavenders we can grow around here. 
that you would have to be concerned about. The great thing about this, it smells funny and tastes funny, <laughs> but it is one of the best plants for pollinators. It usually starts blooming in October and continues through April even, um, a much longer bloom time than any of the other lavenders. Lavenders will attract hummingbirds and butterflies and pollinator bees. Um, so they're tough, sun worshiping, um, low water use. They just need that well draining soil. If not, this is what happens. Usually by around August, it will look okay one day and a day or two later, it will look like a portion or all of your lavender has been hit by a blowtorch, just turns crispy. That's an indication of insufficient drainage. During the monsoon season, if we have really high humidity and these get water too much, or we have you know, great, sufficient, wonderful rains, these could have problems with their root system and have this, this happen. Um, so make sure you've got well-draining soil. There are English and French thymes that do very well here. Again, sun worshiping, well-draining soil, they're not as finicky as lavenders, but they do want well-draining soil. Marjoram, I just love the fragrance of this plant. They get big. Consider them needing at least a four foot space. Um, they'll usually get at least three to four foot tall and wide. The, the sweet fragrance of their foliage is I think just um, delightful and it, it tastes good also. So that's a relative of oregano. So all these are Mediterranean origin. Rosemaries, we have upright rosemary. Some of them can get four or five or even six foot tall and wide. Others are, are the trailing type or prostrate rosemaries that stay lower, maybe two feet in height and might spread three to five feet wide. So know what you're you know, looking at the nursery and decide, do you want something larger, upright, or lower and spreading. For the most part, you can use any of the rosemaries for cooking. Each type will have just a slight different flavor, um, slightly different chemistry, but they're all edible. Sages, <clears throat> the culinary or um, Mediterranean sage, same as the lavender, they have to have a super well-draining soil but they are superb in full sun. They just flourish in our heat, lovely blooms. I would suggest to get through the summer, um, you know, the best chance of getting through the summer is this fir garden sage. It has a really wide leaf and tends to be a little bit stronger in um, getting through the monsoon and not being affected, but it could still be effective, just like those lavenders, if it doesn't have sufficient drainage. Hey, Kirti, um, someone was asking, is there a specific brand for seeds of plants that are produced and packaged in the USA that you would recommend? <clears throat> oh, we've got quite a few. Botanical Interest has um, a very nice line of, um, herbs and vegetables. Um, oh, there, there's, there are quite a few of them. For more native things, in Tucson, native seeds slash search, S-E-A-R-C-H, has a nice um, array of herbal plants that have been grown in the Southwest here for hundreds of years, as well as the vegetables. So those are two great Great sources. Oreganos, true oreganos are from the Mediterranean. So your Greek oregano, your Italian oregano, be aware there are a lot of beautiful ornamental oreganos that really don't taste very good. So if you wanna use it for cooking, make sure you're gonna get something that will have a, a pleasing flavor. We do have native to Mexico, an oregano-like shrub that will shine in the heat of the summer, gets to be about four to six foot tall and wide. 
very, very drought tolerant, has leaves that have an oregano-like flavor, very spicy, as well as these lovely um, kind of honey-scented flowers that are present through most of the warm season from about late spring on through the summer. So this is a great alternative to a, a true oregano from the Mediterranean region, if you're looking for that spicy flavor. Um, so these are some things that you can just, you know, incorporate out into your desert landscape. You won't have to amend the soil. They need less fragrant, frequent watering. This is from a little bit farther north than the valley, but it does really well here in the valley if you give it full sun and a really well draining soil. For those of you who like things to be very symmetrical and neat and tidy, do not try to grow this. Your hoary rosemary mint will just kind of do whatever it wants growing in this direction or that. It's very free form. The leaves and the flowers that appear in the spring, they're very, very, very small, almost orchid-like in their, their beauty. Intense minty flavor. Jojoba. Now this gets to be quite a large shrub. Many people think that our desert plants that have this look, smaller leaves, that silvery foliage, they think, oh, boring. These can be great workhorses in your landscape as a phenomenal background to make other plants be stronger features in your overall design. If you look here, um, you just partially see a prickly pear in front of this jojoba. Well, that contrast really makes that sculptural form of the prickly pear stand out. Or the silvery foliage makes um, blooms, uh, maybe reds or blues, just really be more vibrant than if they had you know, too much other conflict that's not so neutral as what we get with our, our jojoba. Tough as nails, super drought tolerant once they, they get going. Interesting thing, you have separate male and female plants with your jojoba. The female is the only one, once it gets pollen from the male flowers on its little receptacle, pollination occurs and you get these nut-like seeds that develop. And this is where jojoba oil comes from. It's, it's actually a liquid wax, but with its liquidity, um, we refer to it as an oil, but that <coughs> can be used for so many different things. And you can use, um, can eat the, the seeds. A lot of wildlife depends on this as a food source also. And our, our ephedras, we have a good few number of species of ephedras that grow within Arizona, the, the dry areas, there are two that are available through the nurseries. The ephedras have a lovely sculptural form, mostly just these stems, upright stems, if you grow them in full sun. Don't put these in the shade. They'll be floppy and just pathetic looking. In full sun, they'll have this really upright sculptural form. The one species that is available from some local growers is the ephedra nevadensis. It has a more of a bluish or grayish green stem. Um, really no leaves, just scale-like structures on our ephedras. The other one that's available locally is the ephedra viridis with a more yellow green stem. Beautiful sculptural form. These can range from about three to four foot in height to five or six foot for some really aged plants. And also it depends on the species. So we have the same situation as we did with our jojoba, separate male and female plants. But these aren't flowers, they're cones, more similar to our conifers. The male produces pollen, which floats through the air and is picked up by the receptacle of the female. And then you have seed production on the female plant. So full sun. Aloe vera from Africa. It is a wonderful 
succulent plant that can get through periods of drought. I do see these sometimes planted out in full sun in the valley. Do yourself and the plant a favor. Locate it where it has a little bit of midday or afternoon shade during the summertime. Winter, it will flourish in all day sun. This is about the time of year when you have these glorious yellow flowers that will attract many, many hummingbirds and just bring um, a lot of interest with the color and form of these plants in your garden. The Mexican mint marigold, um, or some people call it Mexican tarragon, it is actually related to our um, ornamental marigolds. This is a fall bloomer. Look at those magnificent golden flowers. This plant is a small perennial, usually gets to be about two feet, maybe up to three feet in height and spread. In the fall, it has these lovely flowers. Both the leaves and the flowers have kind of an anise or licorice-like flavor. Most winters, the plant will die back to the ground. Around mid or late March, all new foliage and stems start to grow and cycle through all over again. So this is great in full sun or very light shade. This is a perennial Monarda that does very well here. It can take a good amount of sun. Just make sure with this one that you at least annually give a nice layer of compost mulch around the root zone. And that, that will keep this very, very happy. The plant will produce these clusters of lovely flowers at the stem tips. And then that's in the spring. And then by midsummer, it'll start to get kind of scruffy. You could even just cut it back towards the ground, let it kind of rest for the rest of the summer and it perks back up again with new growth in the fall. <clears throat> this is the native annual. You'd put your seed out around, oh, late October or into November. And then by usually April, you would have these stacked whorls of delightful blooms great for you know the beauty. You can use both of these for teas um, and they will attract hummingbirds and butterflies and bees to your garden. So we've got both an annual and a perennial Monarda that we can include in our gardens. And this is our wonderful native annual wildflower, the desert chia. It's very slight in form, so make sure you put down enough seed that it will be a visible addition to your garden. One of the, the plants that you're gonna put down the seed in the fall, and then you'll get the wonderful spring blooms. Now, a little bit more traditional array of herbal plants, parsleys. They are cool season growers. The, they are considered actually biennials that could live for two years. I think rarely does the curly leaf parsley get through the first summer more likely would be the flat leaf or Italian parsley to make it through its first summer. But either way, you would, if you wanna to try to keep these growing um, through the two year cycle, make sure they're going to be in your garden someplace where they'll get a little protection during the summer. But you could just grow them as a, an annual for the cool season also. Basil, wonderful. These can be perennials if you protect them from the cold in the winter. They can flourish for um, maybe two or three years before they start getting kind of tired. There are so many wonderful basils, not just the sweet basil, that you can grow here. It's so fun to have um, a range of basils for different uses. Oops, lemon balm. We're always looking for something to grow in the shade, lemon balm is a nice shade herb. And of course it has that lemony flavor that's so delightful for teas and things like that. And mints, oh my gosh, I don't know how many mints are available these days. It was a few hundred historically, um, all with slightly different flavors. If you grow your mints in the ground, I would recommend that you control them by a trick with a five gallon nursery pot slice the bottom out of it. And generally those pots are over a foot deep. Plant that bottomless pot in the ground, leave about an inch of the lip above ground. 
fill it with really nice rich soil and plant your mint in that. That keeps all those runners from just going every direction. I wish I had known that as a child. It was my job to control the mint. And a, a, a cool season grower, the calendula or pot marigold, these are fabulous. You could, if these are in just the right location, cool enough for the summer, these could actually turn into a perennial. You have a range of beautiful yellows and oranges with the different varieties of calendulas. And chamomile, a cool season growing annual, usually around February or so, you can start harvesting the flowers and they're productive usually till about April. Chamomile hey. tea, yes. Oops. Hey, Kirti, I just wanted to let you know it is 6.30. We still have everyone here on the line, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions um, queued up right now, but if you all have any, please go ahead and um, start submitting them. Yes, sorry, we've had a lot of great questions. Um, I know. <laughs> going a, a little over time, I certainly understand if you need to leave us, but I've got a few more plants if you want to stay with us for a few more minutes. Uh, Borish is another, another cool season grower with a very um, mild cucumber flavor to those gorgeous flowers. And cilantro, some people uh, you know, have them say, what am I doing wrong? Most likely you're trying to grow it at the wrong time of the year. Cilantro will not grow when it's over about 90 degrees, period. So you can start planting the seed when we cool down in the fall and you can you know, have successive plantings, but once we heat up, that's it. Um, so any, any part, the leaves, the flowers, all of these parts are edible actually. And the cilantro will draw so many different pollinators and beneficial insects. Nasturtium, I showed you the example of the, the freeze damage, but oh my gosh, the flowers and leaves are edible and they are a tangy, peppery um, delight for the tongue. And peppery, black, like black pepper, not like chili pepper. Uh, they are available in kind of mounding or bush forms or trailing, climbing, vining forms, range of beautiful colors. Whorehound, this is for most people a weed, but oh my gosh, this is about the best thing to cut a really nasty cough that's coming from deep in your, your chest. It tastes nasty, but it does the trick. Epizote, used in a lot of bean dishes and things like that down in Mexico, this would be a warm season annual. I love garlic chives. They are really tough. They look very delicate, but they can take full sun here in the desert. <clears throat> they, they do prefer a little bit of an amended soil, but full sun and around August, they will pop up these lovely uh, blooms that are clusters of star-shaped little white flowers. So you can eat the flowers and the leaves above ground. Um, even though it's called garlic chives, it's just the above ground parts that you would eat. So um, if you want a grassy form in your landscape, why not one that you can also eat? Um, the lemongrass is fabulous and can be used in so many um, Thai or um, dishes, things like that. So those are just a few examples of things, of the hundreds and hundreds of herbs that we can grow in our yards and our gardens here in the desert. Um, so many of them are very um, drought tolerant, water efficient to be incorporated in our desert landscapes. But for those special spots, you can grow a lot of wonderful traditional herbal plants that you're going to need a little bit more fertile soil and a little bit more water. But if you're concentrating those things in one area, um, it's still a great use of our water resources. So I thank you so much for joining us.